Okay. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, so we're going to pick up where we left off last week. And actually, since it's only three of us, I think I'm going to sit and Good. the camera has a problem with that. That's too bad. We can. Um, and, and what I want to do today is I want to spend some time and fresh enough time on the names and, and how these names evolved and how these names reflect where the mothers were because you know again we, we just rattle off these names we mention only Yehuda we don't think about what each one is saying. Our Friedman, our Friedman please come up to the speaker. We don't really realize what these names are saying and if we have stopped to think about it as my students say to me every year, why do we give our children these names? Like, why do boys have these names? It's a good question. Um, well, they're not named into show up. Pardon? They're not named into show up. Okay, but Mitzvah Shalach actually isn't such a bad name. He lived 969 yeah, years. Yeah, a very a big mouthful for kids to princess. Right, but so is, you know, these people like, uh, you know, David Yitzchak or oh, something. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, that's why I, I was going to my son who was born, whose name is Ruben. He was born after nine years of infertility treatments and... So we figured, okay, we've got one shot. Dr. Knapp, please call the front office. Because we didn't think we were going to have any more. And we had, I had my father and both grandfathers and my husband who had a great uncle to, um, who never had any children. So it was four names. It would have been Reuven, Eliezer, Mayer, Mordechai. I'm like, okay, I really have compassion, number one, on the child, but number two, on whoever has to you know, making a Torah for him, or whoever has to give an Aliyah to the Torah, like it's just like the Aliyah is going to be over before they say the Mishmer. So we stuck with three names, um, and Ruben Eliezer Mayer, and his English name Marcus, who I, is for the other grandfather, the Mordechai, who is Marcus. So it gets, you know, and at least we only call him Ruben, but I do know people who. Dr. Nath, Dr. Nath, if you're in the building, please come anyway, to the so let's, um, Dr. Let's Dr. Nath. Get into the names here. Um, and, okay, we're going to start with Pasuk Lamed Aleph. Vayar, and we talked about last week how this marriage did not start off on <laughs> very good fitting. And whether the word snu'ah in terms of, of hated for Leah, does it mean, according to the simple explanation, <coughs> hello, hello, according to the simple explanation that, in fact, Yahoo hated her, which seems to be what the Ramban says, and certainly is the most literal translation. What we're going to see in in some of the Mepharshim is that there's a very strong opinion that no, he did not hate her because she was a tzaddikah and he was a tzaddik, and how could he hate her? And, and this is the tact that the Radak takes, that in fact it doesn't mean that she was hated, but she was loved comparatively less, and she therefore felt hated that it's a reflection of how Leah feels rather than an objective reality of, of emotion. Um, and we also know that, that the opposite of love is not necessarily hate. The opposite of love can just be indifferent. But, you know, she, and we're going to see this, she very keenly felt. Yeah, here, Ascot, please come to the front office. Okay. All right. So, and this is this on Pasuk Ramadal. This is where the Ramban, which I think we did last week, where the Ramban goes and he says that Hashem, what did Hashem see? Hashem saw what was in Yaakov and, and Leah's heart. In other words, only God can know what is in our heart. We have similar phrasing by, you know, and, and God saw their suffering and God heard their cries and, and in, in the sense that it's not just looking like we imagine kind of looking down on high, but it's it's that much deeper sense of knowing and perceiving and understanding. So the Ramban says that God saw that Leah's motives were pure and that the fact that Yaakov and Rachel felt about her the way they did was 
misguided. Understandable, but misguided. And therefore, he opened her womb. By the way, she also had infertility issues <coughs> at the get go. Um, and Rachel remained infertile. Or she remained empty, empty wound. But Tahar Leah, she became pregnant, but Taylor Ben, and she gave birth to a child, but Tikra Shemo. And you can see that in all but I think two cases, the mother's name, the ch children. But Tikra Shemo Rituvain, she calls him Rituvain. Ki Amra, Ki Ra'a Hashem Be'onhi, Ki Ata Yaha'aveni Ishi. So she says, Hashem saw my suffering, and we know Oni is not just pain, it's anguish, it's, it's of a physical nature, not just of a spiritual nature, right? We talk about the Inuyim Ta'anu et Nashotechem on Yom Kippur, these are the five things that we're not allowed to do. Which we talk about Lechem Oni, we talk about how the Egyptians, the Inu Otam, that they oppressed them. This is, this is pain, this is really, harsh physical pain and you know I think anybody who has suffered from loving someone who doesn't love them back can identify with this kind of pain or if nothing else wanting something so badly that is completely and totally out of your control Wh whatever it is whether it's it's love whether it's academic ability, whether it's athletic ability, like that sense of no matter how hard I try, this is beyond me, I cannot do it. And, you know, to quote the commercials, depression can hurt. So it's a physical pain, Hashem saw it, and then she says, and now God, now my husband will love me. So there's, an, there's a juxtaposition of pain and love. So we, we, we see from Leah's own mouth that this child somehow represents for her, and we're going we're gonna to do some of the refreshing, this child represents for her a removal of pain and love put in its place, which means that the source of the pain was the absence of love. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, fine. Then she gets pregnant again. But Tahar O, she gets pregnant again, but Taylor Bin, she has another child. But Tomer, Ki Shama Hashem, Ki Snua Anohi. Hashem has heard that I am Snua, whatever that means. And some of the Mepharshim says Ra'a and Shama are the same thing. And some of the Mepharshim talk about how, you know, and where the Orachayim alludes to this, Yaakov is still kind of muttering under his breath. So he heard that I am hated. Vayitain et zeh, vatikra shimo. So somehow the second child is supposed to be a response to the hatred. Okay, I'm, we're going to do all four of them back to back, and then we're going to look in the Mikrashi. Then she gets pregnant again. Um, now she has a third child. She gets pregnant again, but again, <coughs> and she gives birth. So this time, my husband, my man, will accompany me, will, will be by my side, basically. Because I gave him three children, al kein karash shemo levi. So Yaakov called him levi, which I find interesting, in the sense that it seems, and I think it's the Ram, either the Ramban or the Orachayim, I don't remember whom, who says that what Yaakov did was he took into account that there is a relationship beginning to form here, that now with this third child, Yaakov is taking her feelings into account. He names the child what she has indicated to him to name it. And then but according to the Midrash, there's also Ruach HaKodesh going on here. So it's like this fusion. And then finally, Vatahar O Vatele Ben, she gets pregnant again, she has another child. Vatomer Hapa'am 
you know, instead of and this time, I will thank God. She called him Yehuda, but and she she ceased from bearing. In other words, she stopped getting pregnant as easily as she was. How do we know that she had difficulty? Is it because of the only that you said, or is it more pain, physical, and, and the, the fact that it says Vayiftach et Rachma rather than just Vataha? Okay, that there seems to be there was something that. Physically, was there was a block, and God removed that block. Like we typically don't think of Leah as having had infertility treatment, or, you know, or having infertility issues, um, and it seems that she did. Okay. For all her pregnancies, it seems odd that she only speaks of Hashem and only speaks after they're born. That I mean, you. An alternative <coughs> is asking Hashem before she was born. You know that with Yehudu, with Yehuda, where she recognizes um, Hashem. So there's that. There seems to be that um, I don't know kind of disconnect between, as opposed to Rachel, who we kind of I, I don't know if it's textual or the image that we have of asking Hashem before both. In other words. I think, and, and this is based on, on the Mepharshim around Moshe's birth. In other words, why does it say Vatahar Vateled? Because it's not a given. You know, it's not a given, and it certainly wasn't a given then, that just because you got pregnant, you would give birth, and just because you would give birth that the child would, would survive. That's why even in modern halacha, we have, a, we have a halacha, which I don't know how its evolution, but the halacha is that before a child is 30 days old, one does not have to sit shiva for that child, okay? Um, because e the, at that point, children weren't considered viable, and we know that in, in, even until maybe 50 years ago, child mortality under the age of six was huge. So I, my response to you would be the fact that she doesn't name him, name the child or doesn't acknowledge God until that child is born and healthy in her arms. But then the first thing she does do, as opposed to Rachel, which when she finally, you know, has that child, is she recognizes God. And when we get to Yosef, which I don't know if we're going to get to today, but we get to Yosef, we, we see that there's a big question around what is Yosef's name and why is he named that. Okay. There are comments before we dive into some of the worship here. Does everyone say that Yaakov named Levi? What the Pasuk says. The, it's not, it says it's <coughs> Av came Harashmo Levi. And the right So it's male, the grammar is male? Yeah. Therefore he called his name as opposed to in all of the others it's she, it's Kara or Vatikra and she called as opposed to Vayikra. So the ground, the text itself says that he referred to him, and one of the Mepharshim that I went through says, you know, and, and there is a reason why Yaakov was the one to give the name to Levi and to Binyamin, but I will explain it anon, and I didn't get to the anon yet. So, okay, so you have, you have your sources in front of you, and what I try to do is, is organize things chronologically more, than, more or less. Um, so, so we're going to start with the Radak, with David Kimchi, um, who lived in the, I want to say, 10 hundreds. I'm old. He's the one I always forget. I know he predates the Ramban, because the Ramban quotes him a lot. So he's, he's so the Radak. And, and the Radak is, is an interesting read. Associate, typically associate Radak with Navi, because that's kids learn Radak. Um, but the Radak was w an early Parshan. He was from Svarad rather than from Ashkenaz. And he, while he paid very, very close attention to the text, <coughs> he tried to kind of get a little bit into the psyche under the text which I just find really fascinating for, for somebody writing a thousand years ago. 
So on Pasuk Lamed Bet, when, when Rachel, I'm sorry, when, when Leah names Reuven, right, um, when, he, when she says, Ki ata yeha, they need he, she, now he will love me, and I even underlined it for, for you, ke achoti. Because he's the one who says that she was the one who felt hated because she was left loved. So if you say that Yaakov loved Leah, then what do these names mean? Right? So he's saying that according, according to the Nadak, what Leah say, saying is, is that now he will love me. What's the definition of love? the degree of feeling he has for my sister. Um, and, and he then continues, right? In, in Lamed Dalid, similarly, he says, Vahaya nilva la'ahavati yoter me'ahavat achoti ki aladati lo So now that I, he has, now he loves me as much as my sister, and now hopefully he will come to love me even more. Like he will literally lean towards me as opposed to towards my sister. Um, so we see in, in Leia through the eyes of the Radak, there is a, an internal sense, <coughs> at least for now, growing confidence. And then um, and then, oh, he's the one who's the one who says that that it's Le that he named Levi, which and he says in the first first line, if Shar Gam came, he says, um, I'm sorry, Al Kain Karash Shemo Kima Amar Leia, right? Ki Samach Beholido, he was happy with his his Levi's birth, which kind of there's an underlying implication which makes me very sad. The um, Efshar Gam Kain Shara Aben Nivua Kibene Levi Yu Abde Hashem O More Hatora Vihiu Nilvim El Hashem Vize Ye Nachlata Umima Mar Ishta Umi Mashara Aben Nivua Karash Molevi. That this name was a name that was given to effectively by both of them. And then finally with Yehuda, the Ode et Hashem, Ein li ela lahodot ulishabcho shonatan li yoter mimash vakashti mina. And what the Radak here is alluding to is this, is, is one of two things. One possibility is the famous Midrash, that the four women, or at least Rachel and Leah, knew that Yaakov was destined, as well as Yaakov, was destined to have 12 children. The assumption was each one of them would have three, so that Leah, when, once she had more than her share of three, then, um, then she was happy. That's, that's on a very midrashic level. On a more shot level, one could say that, that she's saying, you know, and, and we're gonna get to this once we get to the turn the page, literally, that the fact that Yaakov kept on having sexual relations with her was very pleasing to her because once she stopped getting pregnant, he stopped having relations with her. Even though that's kind of counterintuitive. <coughs> um, but it's like, okay, if you're not going to have any more kids, then I'm not going to bother sleeping with you. And a lot of them, of course, say this. So you could see it that way. Or if nothing else, it's like, okay, you know, two children, you've got two, now, now you literally both have your arms full. And it's like, it's not just two plus one more, it's, it's like now there's a real equality between mother and father because they're, you know, you need one hand for each child, basically. So that's, um, that's the redact. Um, the Or HaChaim picks up on something very interesting in the naming of Ruvain and Shimon. And he says that it would seem that the names should be the other way around. That what happens in a relationship, right? He says, um, I'm in the first line here, but Ra'iti latet leif b'seder ha'shemot so 
והיא אמרה בראשון, אתה יהיה הרווני, ובשני, הסרת השנאה עוד, אוקיי, הסרת השנאה, תראה. סורי דה טקסט איז סו טייט, אני סטיל טריינג טו לרן דה ארט אוף אקצ'לי קופינג אנד פייסטינג אנד בר אילן אנד קרום דון גט אלונג סו וואל, אבל אינטרנט אקספלור אנד איי דון גט אלונג סו וואל, סו וואל וורקינג און איט. So what the Orachayim started, the Orachayim was a, a Sephardi who lived in, I want to say Turkey, Salonika, don't remember when, 14th, 1500s, it was one of the early catalysts. I, lo- <coughs> I, I love his Parshanut. He, he parallels the Abarbanel in that he lays out a bunch of questions. And then answers them. And he's also very, you know, some, like some of the more quote-unquote contemporary Mepharshim, like the Malbi bin Hirsch, he's very, very in tune with omni-significance, with the fact that like different words, each word kind of means something important, like they're not random. So the, he picks up on the fact that this is normally one would think in a relationship that the first thing that happens is that the dislike leaves And then the love comes in and replaces it. Whereas here, the names seem to reflect the opposite. That the first thing she's focusing on is the presence of love. And the second thing she focuses <coughs> on is the removal of hate or discord or, or whatever. Okay. Um, od, he continues, od mahi kabanata be'omra. Um, od, um, I think something else. Oh, Hadal, like for the fourth, for the, for the third and the fourth one, Hapam Yelabeh, Vekem Mugdam, Lo Nitma, Luhu La, in other words, and then it's like, what is, what is this about the third one, now he's going to be with me, he wasn't with her up until then, like, how'd she get pregnant? Okay. So, Achein, Hatzadeket, Aleha HaShalom, this is so beautiful, because he views Leia in such a beautiful way. He says that this, this, this righteous woman, Allah al-Shalom, l'tzad shekatam kadam la ha-ma'amar sh'alav chalta be'eneha, ki hi chalko shal pesa, v'hagam sh'ra'ata sh'nes'eit li'yakov, e'en davar ze matzik b'liba, ki hi bat zugo. So he says as far, that the first, what Leah is, worrying about is the fact that really she's supposed to marry Asaph. That this is her bat zu, ben zu. That this is the one that she is slated by Lord <coughs> and by destiny to marry. And she's worried that this marriage to Yaakov is a sham. Velazeh kishra'ata shenitein la ben amar habadai כי לצד, רח מי השם עלי לצד שלא הייתה אהובה, כי לרח מי השם עלי, that she gave birth, she said in her heart, right, that, that now, now that God gave me a child, this proves that this is, marriage is meant to be. Right? And, and then he says, okay? That it, according to the Or Hachayim, it never occurred to her that Yaakov hated her for herself. She was thinking, I am destined to be Asa's <coughs> wife. He's not supposed to love me. This is not supposed to be. This is just wrong. I am now his wife. He's still not supposed to love me because I'm not supposed to be his wife. Now <coughs> that I gave him a child, Excuse it's me. basically God's blessing, and now 
he will realize, Yaakov will realize that it's okay to love me because now this, this kind of cloud that's been hanging over our heads is gone and now he can love me. And then, there, then he goes on and he says, the Kimosha Pirash to Pasuklamid Aleph, he agrees with the Radak that Snu'a means loved less. Okay. Um, the Gomu. The low kin haita data. The zohi midat hame usharim. Asher al kin kishinitan la ben nishon. Ama kize ba la hashlim ha haser shehi ha ahaba. Okay. And, and the Urachayim says beautifully that this is the, the lot of those people who are truly tzaddikim, that they always see the best, the, the midah of the, the, the ones that are satisfied, that they always see things in the best possible light. So now that, so she figured now that the child is here, now that the child validates this union, he can love me as much as he loves my sister, whose union was valid because they were the, both the younger siblings. I was wrong. And I think that's, to me, this is my own insight. Eliana Factor, Eliana Factor, please come up to Mrs. Vito. Also, Yonina Siegel, Yonina Siegel, come on up. When she says, Kishama Hashem. And what was she hearing? She was hearing Yanko, like, muttering to himself that, you know, I don't want to be married to her, I want to be married to her, and yeah, fine, she has a child, so now I can't divorce her, blah, 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 like kind of the stuff along the lines of the Ramban. So the Orachim says, Lama Freya to Ahayiti, Vima. Vima Shachashati, Shelo Hayali, Ella, Mechusar, Meahava. God, God understood what even I didn't understood. I mean, he knew that I really am snua, that I really was hated. ben to remove that hatred. and then now maybe love can come. Ve'la'ze amra, okay, ki Hashem Hashem and now when she got a third son, she said, and from now forward, um, and now this third <coughs> child, it absolutely incontrovertibly proves that she is supposed to be his wife because three is a chazaka. Right? This isn't an accident. And then he goes on and he says, and then with the fourth child, she realized that she had more than this quarter portion, this degel, right? She had, like if there were going to be four corners, right? That she had more than, so he's also presuming this, this nebuah. But it's so fascinating that what the Or HaChayim is, is saying, and I can so kind of read this in a novel or see it in a, in a screenplay, is like, the, the self-loathing that Leia must have had that, you know, you kind of can see the scene where her father's dragging her in and she doesn't want to and she's not only because she, you know, doesn't want to break the, the deal but because she fears in her heart of hearts that this union was never supposed to be, was never ordained that she was supposed to marry the older one and, and there's nothing to be done against the will of God and and then, you know, she gets pregnant, and she's like overjoyed, and then Yaakov is still, this is weird, so much like a soap opera, Yaakov still doesn't really want to be with her, and then she, he finally does, and she has a second child, and it's, it's only with the second child when he still doesn't really love her, that she realized that he never loved her in the first place. Um, and then, it, by the third child, it's almost like she doesn't expect him to love her anymore, but she does expect him to ex realize the fact that this was meant, and she walks around with that knowledge, that that at least that peace, knowing that okay, this this is ordained by God. I can't control my husband, and I can't control his emotions, but I can control how I feel about myself. Um, 
what becomes interesting is, is that it is specifically Yehuda who is that no strings attached child that is the one that grows up to the position of leadership. Right? That it is, it, it's that it's because it, one could say that because he is born with no baggage and that Leah is genuinely happy and joyous and grateful that she was able to raise him that way, that he's not carrying around the anger that Shimon and Levi carry with them and the sense of burden and responsibility that Ruben carries with him. Yeah? But when you describe um, that, that Laban takes Leah against her will to I'm sorry, because it says earlier in the text, if you go back to um, Pasuk Gimel, and it says, and it was in the evening, that he took her and he brought her. And and even afterwards, like Lavan explains the apple shape, we don't do it that way. Right. We give the like there's a certain right. and we and marry up the oldest, oldest that this is the way it's done. And the word vayikach um, means with some kind of pressure, whether it's physical force, persuasion, monetary force, and then the vayave he brought. You know that that's clearly not. It's not, it wasn't the heat, but uh, a love. So, so the like you can't in this picture where she understands that maybe this was against God's will as well, and then she becomes convinced of it. According to what the Or HaChayim is saying, that that's what she's maybe thinking, whereas as Radak and, and the Midrash puts it forward that more that she, she desperately believe, wants to be with this Tzadik, and whether it's God's will or not doesn't necessarily enter the picture, but the Ramban certainly says that her desire to be with Sadiq trumps everything else, that it makes right what may have been seen as wrong. But does it not occur to her at any point that the hatred that she feels, or the, lack of, the lack of love, the hatred that she feels, that it's because she was involved in tricking that outcome? No, according to the Ramban, she definitely, she whether she knows it or not, that's certainly how he feels. According to the Ramban, the reason he hates her is because she duped him. Right, but, but none of these seem to... Correct. These these Mepharshim do not... The simplest explanation. Right. Um, Except that you could also, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, is that you could say that Laban could have said to her, you will consummate this marriage. Like, no, I understand that she is an active participant. And she gives, Rachel gives her the signs and she gives Well, that's also Midrash. Like, if we're going to we'll pare it down. Okay, okay, yeah. so how does it happen that he doesn't realize who he's with? So, I think that <laughs> Uh, number one, if he's drunk, right? Or if, even if he isn't drunk, if he's somewhat inebriated. Number two, it was dark. Number three, they didn't, the, the, the norm was is you didn't speak. Um, if they were of similar build, whatever, it, it does strain the imagination, particularly the way we think about marital intimacy now. But it's not impossible. It's not impossible. And, you know, we also don't even know how much contact did Yaakov and Rachel and Leah have during those seven years. Like, just because they lived in the same clan, in the same household, doesn't mean that the girls weren't veiled. Right? We don't like, and that's the whole thing with Tamar when it says that she took off her widow's clothes and she put on her, her veil. Was that because that's what women wore when they went out, or did she specifically put something on to disguise herself? And you could say, how did Yehuda not recognize his daughter in law who had already married two? Right. I mean, you would think he would have right. known her. And the Medrash actually says that, that it's because she was veiled even in his house. Like, so it seems to be that this. You know, what we think of as the classic Arabian 
you know, I'm not talking about a, a, a burqa, but even this idea of you wear a veil and your face, like that might have been normative dress though, mm -hmm. nothing else, just why? to keep, protect you from the elements. Why didn't, um, why doesn't she marry Teresa before? She's the oldest and he's the oldest. Good question. I don't have a good answer. That's a, I mean, he unless he was her off first, then he wouldn't have Correct. Feet. Unless he was just like, it's possible, and again, I'm thinking on my feet, is that just like Abraham sent Eliezer to claim Rivka, right, it's possible, it would make a lot of sense, that Betuel was waiting for Yitzchak to send for Leah, and Rachel for that matter, to marry his sons. So it's, it's possible that he might not have thought that Yitzchak was even alive anymore. <coughs> you know, it, we, we don't we don't know what the degree of communication was, but precedent In sets. Other words, he just showed up. So right, he just showed up. So what? How did they? You know, and then he tells him what happened. Now, once Lava knows what happened, why then does he not send word to Yitzchak? Again, that's a little bit unclear, which is what leads the midrash. And, and the Gemara to talk about how this is all divinely planned. Because if, again, if you start thinking about it just in terms of rules of communication, over the course of seven years, there had to be a way to send a message to Yitzchak saying, um, hi, we have your younger child here, you know, we have a bit of a situation, we need the older one, and, and he doesn't. Also, wasn't Esau, by this time, he had already married, remember? Two, uh, two other women. Yeah. yeah. And right. it says that that was an aggravation. Bailey Jacobson, Bailey, come up here. She convinces Yitzchak to allow to send Yaakov. Right, and then, but then it even strengthens this argument because afterwards, Asa has it says in the text, right? Asa feels bad that he is causing his parents aggravation, <coughs> and he goes ahead and he marries one of the sons of Ketur, the daughter of Keturah, right? So <coughs> one would think Alachas Kama the Kama that. You know, Yitzhak knows that Rivka's brother lives in Haran. Like, why? There are a lot of holes. There are a lot of question marks in this story in terms of what's not written. Um, and I think, you know, I just keep going back to the fact that the Midrash seems very much to feel that there is a divine hand in this because otherwise it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't work. But at a simple level, could we also think that Lavan said to uh, Yaakov, "Where? What's the story with your older brother?" And he said, "He's married to Macha, whatever those the, like. Didn't he marry a woman from but, Egypt right. or whatever?" And Lavan so said, "So then may have given up on that plan and then said, now what? Now right. I got these two daughters, one viable man, and went ahead with his very possible plans. Very possible." Okay, um, you know. All right, we're going to turn the page. Next section of the story. Okay, so she stops giving birth. Now we're in Paragrammy. I think it also means that we turn the page in the source sheet. What am I thinking? Getting through five pages of the source sheet? Oh, that's so funny. Um, okay, we're going to skip the Malvin. Um, Vatikane Rafael. I'm sorry, Vatere Rachel, Kilo Yaldali Ako, Vatikane Rachel Baachota. Um so she sees that she doesn't give birth and she's jealous of her sister. Um, and Rashi says straight out here in Paraglame because Rashi who tries very hard to not condemn the Avot and the Mahot unless they are condemned. Um, you know, this concept that children are a, are a direct indication of moral value, at least in, in her mind. Um, Whereas the Radak says a little bit differently, Kan Ab Davar Shiraata Um Shiraata La Ahota Shiyalda Arba Bani. That makes a lot more sense. Le Yako Vihi Lo Yalda Apiru Echa. Right? That that makes that's a lot 
simpler and closer to the text. Um, and and then um, Malbim, 19th century, goes ahead and says that, that what does he mean by Tere Rachel? Rachel Hashva, um, Shema Shelo Yalda, Ena Besibata, Rak Besibat Yaakov. So at first she thought she's not giving birth because Leah also didn't give birth, so maybe it's not her, maybe it's not Leah, maybe in fact it's Yaakov. Al Zerama, Lo Yalda Le Yaakov. Right, that she didn't give birth. For, for Yaakov, the Kvar Katvu, Chachamei Hateva, She Ahava, Hayitera, Timna Hacholada, Lifame. That sometimes extreme love can impair fertility. Which is, I mean, this is a 19th century person writing. It's, it's an interesting thought, but if you think about it um, biologically, extreme emotion messes with hormones. And, you know, because it raises adrenaline levels. And then everything else starts going off whack. So it's not as crazy Victorian romantic pseudoscience as you might think it is. Just putting it out there. Oh, shechashva kefi ma shekatub lemala shehu inyan hashkachi. That this is some kind of divine... Um, some, some divine providence, misovab gam came me rohava, that also somehow involves this this extreme love that Yaakov has for her. Um, that's that the Kimosha Kata, Vayar Hashem Kisnu Aleya, Vayit Tafet Rahma, Velachem, Vatikane Rachel, Beachat, um, Beachat at Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I just said Be'achotah, my bad, okay? Be'achotah, ki chashva tov haya la, shetiyya hi ha snua pil bad, shetelei badim. I would rather be the snua because then I'm going to have children. The alkin amna le Yaakov havali banim ki ki becha hadava talun. Like she realized once Leah started having children that it's not Yaakov. So what could it be? So what's the difference between me and my sister? It's not my husband's fertility, because she has children, so maybe it's the love that my husband has <coughs> for me that somehow is messing with his sperm, whatever, his ability to reproduce when he's with me, and then, you know, at, or maybe it's some kind of divine thing that ya that Hashem is giving Leah children, because we all know that Yaakov loves me better than her, so you know what, I would rather be less loved and have more children. Yes? In many of these commentaries, um, both Leah and Rachel are very spiritual people, and they attribute what is happening in their world to God. Yes. How growing up in Levine's house does that happen? I mean, he is one of the best <coughs> guys. He does not seem like a spiritual figure. He's a manipulator. I mean, he's a polytheist, that he's not an atheist. In other words, I think in, in the, the ancient world, Everything was ascribed to the oh, gods. The, powers. Okay. the difference here is, uh -huh. is that it is they now have come to the realization of the one God who controls okay. everything else. Uh -huh. okay. um, but that's in and of itself is not a weird concept. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and and I, as I said, I think last week the only conversation that we ever hear between Yaakov and Rachel is an argument, which is kind of sad. Um, so, so, so she goes to Yaakov, a Yomer El Yaakov, because she, she figures, okay, this is, you're the one in control here. Hava libani me'im ayin me'itan. Give, give me children, or, or bring to me, or provide for me children, and if not, then I am dead. And there's lots of debate about what that means, and, you know, that somebody who's barren is, like, dead, or... I will kill myself, or I feel like a dead person, but she's clearly pinning it on Yaakov. Um, and, and we're going to do the Ramban, but basically, you know, the justification for her going to him is, you know what, your parents also didn't have children, and at the end of the day, God listened to your father. Right? They were both davening, and, and Hashem listened to Yitzchak, and Rivka got pregnant. So if we don't have children, clearly you're not davening hard enough. Like, this is your fault, whether it's genetic, whether it's biological, whether it's love, whether it's tefillos, whatever. This is, this is about you. 
Clearly, you're the one who can control <coughs> who has children and who doesn't. Vayichar af, right? Yaakov gets angry. And he says, Hatachad Elohim Anochi. He gets angry, Birachel. He, like, not just at, but, like, really deeply. Vayomer Hatachad Elohim Anochi. Am I in place of God? Kimanam mimeni pribet, I'm sorry, kimanam mimeich pribeten. And wow, what does that mean? The mimeich. Like, that's harsh. He's angry. Right? Um, you know, Rachel, may I remind you that you're the one who seems to have the problem here, not me. This is about you. And the Ramban beautifully explains this, this interchange and why it's so heated and, and passionate. Um, and he says, the um, Alder Hapshat, okay, go down to the second paragraph. Alder Hapshat, Amra like. Okay, so that he should he should daven for her. Aval Okay, so according to the Ramban, she is threatening suicide. Saying that if you if I, you have to daven for me to have children, now she's not demanding give me children. You have to daven. You have to make sure that I have children because if not, I will kill myself. Dibra shelo kehodke. She spoke inappropriately. The kin ata, and in her jealousy, the chashva ki beahavato ota yit. Yit ane Yaakov yilbash sak the aper yit halel adji yula banim shelo tamud bitzara and she thought that you know she basically is manipulating Yaakov, and because he loves her so much that he's going to wear sackcloth and ashes and daven until God in fact listens to him like Choni Hamagel, right? By Yichar af Yaakov and af Yaakov Yaakov the angry she'in tefilat hatzad. That if it's not in their hands that their tefillos be answered. I'll call Panim. And that's and he also got angry at him, her because she he knows she's manipulating him. He knows she's making these I don't know if idle threats, but irrational threats. And therefore he gets angry at her. Like, don't play with my emotions. Right? That's that's basically what what he's saying. Um, and then Or Hachaim adds a slightly different spin to it at the bottom, Vayichar Af, the Hatam Lefi Shahot Siami Pia Davar Klala. Sheamra meita anochi, but the var had sadikim afilu besedur ze ye asu roshen. And like, and he was scared. <coughs> like, al tiftach pel satan. Exactly. She's a tzadika. What she says has weight, and it's like, oh my gosh. So he's reacting. It's that like, you know, that gut sense. Like when you all of a sudden you turn around and your kid is missing and then you find your kid and the first thing you do is scream your head off because you're so terrified. Oh my gosh, what would have happened? Kind of thing. And then you calm down. That's his, according to the Orachayim, that's his reaction. Like, if something happens to you, I'll die. So, yeah, once again, this is not an auspicious beginning, um, but she does hear him. And we hear that she hears him in what happens next. She, first of all, she doesn't answer that. So what she does say is she says, She pulls a sara and she says, you know what? Okay, I'm going to do my hishtadlis. I'm going to do with my, what, what your grandmother did. And the Ramban here explains, he continues his explanation, and he says that 
she, being Tzadika, that she was, took the Musr, and number one, she did something about it, because having children is not just dependent on the man. It's a two-way street, so clearly she had to substitute another female for herself. And number two, she did that. And we know that she did that because she says, God heard my prayer. And that, that in a way, this is what makes Rachel the tzaddikah that she was, is that she, she hears the Musa where it's given, and instead of getting angry back, she puts her head down and she says, you're right, I was wrong, and now I'm going to fix it, which is what she is. <coughs> and then finally, they have another child. She has some... Um, Ben Shemila Yaakov, Naftule, Elohim Naftalti. Um, big machoket about what these words mean, but we'll keep it kind of simple. That one possibility means is that God, God has tied me, like patil is a string, or Naftule, Elohim Naftalti means I have begged God for beggings. <coughs> based on two different sources. If you want, you can look in Rashi. Im um, either I'm tied with my, now literally tied with my sister, or I have begged God because of my sister. Gam um, now I have overcome, and she called him Naftali. So basically, Naftali means like, um, we're even, or, you know, you can't push me around anymore. You being God, Yaakov Leia, whoever. So that's Dan and Naftali, who don't get much press after that. So I think we're going to stop here. I apologize for stopping a little early. As I said before, I realized literally at one minute to one that I had forgotten to do something for my next class, which I need to do. Um, so next week, we will um, get through the Judaim. Fun story, fun story. Um, if you can, if those of you who have access to a Tanakh or to, you know, phone, whatever, bring it next week because we're going to take a quick look at the story of Avshalom. Because um, when we look at Ruvain, we're also going to look at Ruvain and Bilha and the bed and what all that meant. And poor Ruvain. Really, his heart is in the right place. And this is a, a lot.